briefly introduce our speakers. So starting off with uh, Boo Norving, who will talk about stroke and corona, a vicious combination. He's one of our WSO past presidents and will share with us the latest data from the Swedish Stroke Register and his thoughts on, on how healthcare and stroke societies should act. And then we also have with us Professor Marion Walker. She's Professor of Stroke Rehabilitation at the University of Nottingham and past chair of UK Stroke Forum and will detail why it's crucial that stroke survivors and their carers receive ongoing support from a multidisciplinary team of stroke rehabilitation specialists. And her talk will focus on stroke rehabilitation and why it's essential for stroke recovery. And then, as you can see, we also have uh, Peter Sandeko with us. He's Emeritus Professor of Medical Neurology at the University of Edinburgh and Lead Commissioning Editor of the World Stroke Academy and he will moderate the Q&A session later today. So what I'll do now is I'll hand over to Pu. So wonderful, it's working. So welcome everybody and thank you all for participating in this webinar. We think it's a very, very important topic and we are very grateful to see that there are so many of you who have uh, attended and um, will listen to us and then we will have a question and answer and I'm sure we will have a vivid discussion. So I will speak to you about the uh, selected topics on stroke and COVID-19, a vicious combination. First, these are my disclosures. And this is a situation now in the world, in Europe and in Sweden of the coronavirus. And as you can see, we have globally two and a half million of confirmed cases. We have number of 106,000 death globally. In Europe, you see the numbers, and in Sweden, which have been partially quite severely affected, and we will come back to this, you see the numbers um, at the bottom line here. So can we really grasp these numbers? Can we take these numbers into us, what it really means? And uh, sometimes when I see the numbers, I go and look at the numbers of stroke, and I will just share with you the thoughts and reflections on a second that uh, what do we have on the global burden of stroke? Well, we have five and a half million people who die of stroke annually. We have over 30 million new strokes each year. 60% of these are under the age of 70 years. So these are numbers that we even cannot take in. We cannot imagine the magnitude of this, neither of the coronavirus epidemic, neither of the stroke, and I think it gives to me some impression that what are the numbers we are speaking of of stroke is business as usual. This is what is happening. And the good thing, of course, that we can do something of stroke. We can influence it. We can affect it. So what we have seen during the past decades, and I'd be happy to be part of this fantastic movement since I started in practice, is that that is, has been a remarkable period of the acute secondary, acute therapies, secondary therapies, prevention, rehabilitation. It's really been a harvest period with a lot of work, a lot of good science. And now we have come to this stage that we have very important core meshes that we can say for stroke. TAA and stroke are medical emergencies. Need to seek medical attention without delay. This we have now after a lot of fantastic work during several decades. This is far from fully implemented, but these are two marvelous lines that uh, we have and really is a core message. We can do something, medical emergencies, seek medical attention without delay. So what is now happening? What is the influence of the coronavirus um, on this situation? First, I just to remind you on the web page of the World Stroke Organization, uh, stroke care and the COVID-19 pandemic. We have uh, reports from very many countries on the, how stroke care is influenced. And we see that in many countries, there are very, very severe affections on the, the stroke care difficulties with the capacities. And another impression that is also from very many countries is the patients with stroke 
seem to be far less than they used to be. So I will share with you data here from the Swedish Stroke Registry. We just recently took up this data. The Swedish Stroke Registry started almost 25 years ago. All the Swedish hospitals are participating. It has a very high uh, coverage rate. And we have the acute phase of stroke. We have TIA, childhood stroke, also now subarachnoid hemorrhage. And we have a follow-up at three months and 12 months after the stroke. So these are the data now on number of stroke, the absolute number of radius stroke in risk stroke, which we have seen from the start of this year. And you see this brown line, which is 2020, and the blue line is 2019. And what we see, this is a week from the uh, start of the year, is that during February and during the month of March, we see that there are far less more cases of stroke in the registry. We have for the first quarter 5,300 cases last year, this year 3,500 cases. It's a difference of about 1,800 cases is minus 35 percent. No, we know that part of these curves are due to delays in registering and entry into the registry, but uh, we will come back to this at um, this is a real effect that we are seeing here really, and it's a very substantial, very profound effect. Thrombolytic therapy, we also see that there is a clear decline here in the month of March from 246 cases last year, now to 99 cases. And um, what you see are the raised the proportion of patients with ischemic stroke who were treated uh, it's quite high proportions, but the proportions are high because there are so less numbers of stroke that we have uh, during this period. So let's see if something happened now with my screen. I'll go back to it. Thank you. So from back to me, also we see during the month of March a decline from 66 cases last year to 47 cases. So we see that there is a decline and we see that the proportions remain high or even higher, but the, this is factitious because we have another denominator here really. So it's also very disturbing with the acute therapies and we will look uh, more into that. Interestingly, when we look at the numbers of TIA, which we also have in the register, you can see that it's virtually an identical picture that we have with the stroke. We have here a difference of 900 cases, minus 40% of patients with TIA. We have a routine in Sweden that they should come to hospital, and we see that uh, this is not happening, and in particular during the month of March. The pandemic of COVID-19 in Sweden has been very, very heterogeneous, and you can see this on the map that uh, in particular, it has been the region around Stockholm who has been very severely affected, but man many other parts of Sweden has really not had very many cases. This is the part also where I live that uh, very few cases that we see per day. So um, how is this influencing the seeking pattern, the number of cases that we see? Well, this is for stroke in the different six different larger regions of Sweden, and you have here the Stockholm region. Here you see the most divergence of the curves, but actually you see the same pattern here across all the regions in Sweden. And about one third of all Swedish hospitals are not really affected by the hospital capacities. So this is quite remarkable. This is the same for TIA. We also see uh, Stockholm standing out, but we see the very much the same pattern all across the country. And of course, this is very concerning. So I need to um, put out several caveats here because these are Swedish data. The situation will be different in other countries. These are just data taken fresh from the source. There are delays in registration, which may influence data to some extent. We haven't yet done checks for coverage during the time period. We need to do much more detailed analysis on the seeking behavior, spectrum of stroke severity, of delays, if patients are infected or not, 
the chain of care, the acute therapies, rehabilitation, and we will follow up the long term consequences. And very recently also we entered in the stroke registry and in many other Swedish quality registers, two new indicators on COVID-19. Have you been effective? Have there been a test taken of the patient? Uh, we see the same picture on myocardial infarction in Sweden. Almost the same numbers, minus 25% for the entire country, minus 40% in the Stockholm region. So this is not only influencing stroke, this is also influencing uh, myocardial infarction to the same extent, really. So um, here are some of the effects that we can have of COVID-19 on stroke. We can have the effect on the virus on stroke, risk stroke, stroke, risk of stroke. We can have the influence of the different pathophysiologies. We have reports of, of um, strokes in the young who have been affected. We have the situation with the uh, comorbidities, which is very important, and much, much more, which is now being explored. And then we have the indirect effects on stroke. We have the availability of adequate services and care, and we hear this from many countries, how difficult this has been. And then we have the point here, which I think is my main point in my presentation today, the patient seeking care pattern. The lesson we learned is that the advocacy, the awareness information was not strong enough for TAA and stroke to the general population. We really did not expect that it should be so profound effects. It took us by surprise and it took us rapidly by surprise. And what we see here is a real tragedy that uh, is going back several decades in times when patients didn't come to stroke, they wouldn't come to hospital there was no reason because there was no acute therapy, no, nothing you can do with the TIA. We are going back decades and this is a tragedy. Part of this is iatrogenic, that there was not enough information to the general population. And I think this is really very important to share with you. So the message is here, and this is taken from the Canadian Stroke Best Practice Guidelines, which were listed just a few days ago. I was looking for a good summary of my talk and I thought I couldn't do it better than what you have here. Stroke is a medical emergency irrespective of the pandemic and existing evidence-based stroke guidelines should continue to be followed. There is a need to continue to raise awareness with the public that stroke is a medical emergency and they need to seek medical attention without delay despite COVID concerns. Very, very important points, and I think we learned this lesson very, very hard. Again, the website is very, very useful. Here you have also guidelines now from UK, from Canada, from uh, USA, and from uh, the Australia Asia region. Very, very important document for you to read. So with this, thank you for your attention. This is where I live in Dalby, outside Lund. I can have social isolation and uh, you see it's very nice surrounding the atmosphere, the, the um, climate, the sky is looking more magnificent than it's ever been when there are no flights now coming over to the Copenhagen airport over my area. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking me to contribute to, to this webinar and it's great to be able to highlight the importance of rehabilitation um, in this pandemic, a horrendous situation we're having. Um, I just move. So, so like acute care, um, the impact of the pandemic is having a considerable uh, impact on the stroke, the, the services that rehabilitation staff are able to provide. And through, I don't have, I have um, data such as Bose, but we do have information and intelligence across the world of how different services are operating. And again, we see a reduced service delivery for rehabilitation. But we do know that teams are adapting rapidly 
and in line with current demands. So they're constantly updating what they're doing on a daily basis. And although rehab networks are reporting various approaches that they're taking to deliver rehabilitation, the overriding commitment is to deliver the best rehab possible in these challenging circumstances. And we're seeing some real innovative methods of delivery. So I think it's important at this stage just to remember why stroke rehabilitation is crucial for the recovery of patients. We know from the, the Cochrane Stroke Library that there's a wealth of information that service the delivery by a multidisciplinary specialist team does reduce death, reduces disability and prevents our stroke patients from being admitted to institutional care. But we also need to remember that stroke is a complex condition requiring complex interventions by highly skilled staff. So it's important that we get this delivery to our patients. And, and lastly, I think we have to keep at the forefront that stroke doesn't just affect the individual, but it also affects the whole family. So what impact is it having on our stroke rehab units? Well, as Bo has indicated, bed occupancy has been reduced. And this is maybe because patients and their relatives may be reluctant to admit to, to hospital. But also in this period of social distancing, family and friends may not be visiting people who live on their own. So therefore stroke can go unrecognised. And what this means is that there would be delayed input into the stroke rehab units, which is worrying because we know that early rehab helps reduce disability. But we also have work, workforce issues where staff may be isolating because of symptoms or COVID-like symptoms. And we have, we're seeing a shift of redeployed staff perhaps working in stroke units that lack these stroke specific skills that are so needed. So it's important that we upskill these people who have been redeployed um, and, and keep, keep buddying them to make sure that we're delivering the best care. But from my intelligence across the countries, I am hearing that rehab is ongoing within stroke rehab units, albeit on fewer patients being admitted. Um, and of course, staff are wearing protective uh, equipment. But what we are seeing are shortened lengths of stay within these rehab rehabilitation units and wards are trying to get patients back out into the community sooner than ever before. And quite rightly, the focus is on safe discharge. But in doing and putting that focus there, perhaps there's not enough attention on the rehab specific goals. So another uh, outcome of social isolation is that families can, cannot visit onto the wards. And uh, the way wards are managing this is they're using Skype, face, FaceTime, FaceTime, FaceTime to with, with uh, the and, and, and during this difficult time. But this technology can also be used to ensure that carer involvement is still there while on, on, on the unit. So I know of clinicians who are using it to set goal setting and also very importantly with pre-discharge home visits is being used between the patient, the carer and the, the staff member. Psychologists are playing an increasingly important role in stroke wards at the moment because they're not only providing in, uh, uh, support to patients, but they're also providing much needed support to staff and their wellbeing. Staff are concerned about working in COVID environments at the front line and their wellbeing needs to be looked after as well. So psychologists are fulfilling a dual role here. So as we're seeing patients being discharged from hospital earlier, this puts increased caseloads out on community services and early supported discharge services. And also their caseload is increased by 
people who perhaps have never been into hospital, but their disability is being picked up in the community. But I think it's really important that we acknowledge here that there are countries in the world where community rehab isn't as well developed and they have to develop, they have to initiate some innovative ways where the rehabilitation needs of stroke patients can be addressed. So for those community services, we're seeing patients are being triaged and those with a urgent rehab needs or with high risk um, identified, they would, they would be seen face to face. Um, and the things that would be taken into consideration would be their family support and social care surrounding them and supporting them in the community. So those are the sort of things that would, that would prioritise uh, patients for face to face. But what we're mainly seeing is that the majority of stroke rehabilitation in the community is being delivered remotely. And whilst we're encouraging the use of tele-rehab in line with IT governance um, and patients and families' needs, we have to remember that the Cochrane Library and the evidence base is still saying that we need more research around this area. So I think beyond uh, COVID, we need to be looking at the benefits of this, um, but also remembering that this is absolutely the best alternative we have to face-to-face -face therapy at the current time. As I said earlier, it's a family condition stroke and we need to remember the impact on carers and their family. There's great anxiety about being admitted to hospital and also more, uh, more anxiety around patients being discharged quicker with significant disability. So where communication such as Skype and FaceTime isn't available for, for uh, carers and family with healthcare staff, we need to use telephone or any communication at all. That connection is really important. And as I say, the psychological impact for carers and family, not on the incidence of stroke alone, but also on the pandemic, mean that education and support is absolutely crucial. And this is where we need to make sure we have strong linkages with our stroke support organisations. They too are having to work in different ways. And, but they can provide much needed support, not only to the patients, but to families and uh, the wider community. We have many stroke patients who either reside in care homes or are being discharged to care homes. And we're seeing rehab services again being restricted to, to such uh, community dwellings and particularly restriction in homes, care homes that have significant amounts of COVID. So we need to again make sure that we have provision for rehabilitation um, for our stroke patients and our stroke uh, patients in care homes. So what we're seeing is a direction for remote working with much more online resources being used. And this is just a random selection of some of the on online resources that are being used. But the issue for clinicians on the ground is that there is a, an absolute sea of apps and online resources, and they're not, poor clinicians may not be used to working in such a manner. So one example we are doing in the UK is looking at all these line resources and trying to put them into problematic areas that stroke patients may have so that it signposts um, families and stroke survivors to the most appropriate resources that they can use. Another thing that's really important, I think, is that we produce statements and guidance for our services around around stroke rehabilitation. And this is an initiative that we in the UK and Ireland have developed recently, and it's been endorsed by our British Association of Stroke Physicians and indeed the Five Nations. And it isn't meant for you to read the detail in this, it's just mainly to highlight it to you. 
but we think it's important that services understand the importance of maintaining um, maintaining uh, these community services. But we also think it's important that we oh, we also think it's important that we provide guidance for clinicians on the ground. And again, we have produced a document uh, looking at guidance for our stroke services in the UK on remote working. And this is a live document that will continue to be updated. And both of these, I will tweet after this webinar, the links for these, but also that these will be on the, the space for the webinar within the World Stroke Organization. But important that countries are sharing this best practice so that we can learn from each other. So I put this slide in here just to illustrate that uh, there's tremendous support for stroke rehabilitation across the land. This is a picture of my own local uh, community stroke team and what they're holding in their hands are laundry bags that have been especially developed by a local company who have produced it specially for them to put their uniforms in at the end of the day so that the laundry bag can go straight into the washing machine when they're finished. A very simple gesture, but really just as a way of showing appreciation for the work that teams are doing. And I, this is just one small example. The public and families have been really supportive of any ongoing rehab they have. So these are unprecedented times, but in these times we require unprecedented efforts. We are familiar with these working patterns, so we're doing our best and trying to adapt as quickly as we can. But what really gives me a lot of pride is that I see rehabilitation teams really rising to this challenge. And, and I, I can only applaud the hardworking therapists and rehab assistants, the clinicians, volunteers and administrators who are really living this and trying their best because it's really incumbent on all of us to be delivering the best care to our patients. And that's why I think stroke rehab is vital. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And I'll stop sharing my slides now. Thank you very Thank much, you Marian. Very much, Marian. And thank you, Boo, as well, for um, a, a terrific introduction to, to what, what really matters. The questions are coming in fairly rapidly on the Q&A. And for those of you listening, please don't use the chat. Um, uh, please put your questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, we've got quite a lot happening on, streaming on YouTube. It's a bit more difficult for them to submit questions. But I've got a question from uh, Michael Garrow, uh, which I'll feed into the um, debate as well. So the first question was from Dmitry Gulyayev. And he was really interested, in, and I don't know whether you can answer this question, Boo. Given the prothrombotic tendencies of the COVID virus, are, do you think you have any data yet as to whether there are cases in which the stroke is actually the presenting feature of the COVID infection? Yeah. So thank you. No, this is an excellent question, and um, it's been a lot of anecdotal reports on this and. Uh, Yes, I think it can, and it can be, in any case, it can be an early manifestation of the infection because uh, it's an acute stress reaction. We know that uh, there is an increased uh, tendency towards thrombosis. We also hear the reports that were uh, published as a letter in the New England Journal of Medicine of the patients with cryptogenic young strokes that um, Maybe that we are seeing now venous thrombosis to a larger extent. Maybe we are seeing PFO related stroke. This is one of many possibilities. China reported also um, uh, effect on intracerebral hemorrhage and the blood pressure uh, effects that came very early into the disease. So I think there is a lot, lot of potential pathophysiological mechanisms that stroke can occur very early. I think it can even be the very first manifestation, even if I don't know that uh, for sure. 
Okay, so thank you very much. That's a, an interesting question. Um, then coming to a rehab related question from Michael Garrow. Um, Marion, um, you, you mentioned various technology um, uh, ways of handling rehabilitation in the time of COVID. And he was asking, just give us a few more of your thoughts on tracking patients for early supported discharge when teams actually can't get into the patient's house to make a, an assessment of their rehabilitation status. Have you, can you expand a little bit on what you've said already on that? Okay, just unmute your microphone, Marion. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. That's, that's a good question. Um, so this is where I think tracking of patients is absolutely crucial, that the, the linkages between the community teams and the acute service is really important. Um, and although we do have those dialogues working, I think it's more important than ever before. Um, that people are, that the, the both sets of teams know what, what state the patient has come out in and also what needs to be done in the community. But the technology that's being used between teams is again Zoom, Microsoft Teams, um, any type of, in fact I'm hearing uh, lots of technology being used. So, okay, so, the, just... so the, um, your offer to try and kind of prioritise what works best for rehab teams will be really, really helpful. And maybe if you could tweet the links to where you're going to put that information, that will be tremendously helpful. And this was a theme that came up at the tweet chat last night, the hashtag stroke chat WSO, which we'll be repeating weekly. People were saying it's really interesting how everybody's having to change what they do and that's really kind of got rid of a lot of inertia people are suddenly prepared to think about doing stroke care differently and more efficiently under the pressures of covid so there may be some very good things that come out of this disaster so thank you for that reply um we've had a, re a question um from dorina dobreva um, in Bulgaria saying, is there an opportunity to cooperate with best practices in aphasia apps and tools which we could translate to uh, into Bulgarian? So any suggestions on the aphasia front for Bulgaria, Marian? So, so again, interestingly, when we've been looking at the apps, there are more apps for speech and language therapy than any other apps and any of the other. And certainly we will be highlighting some of the, the key ones within our collection that we're putting together. But any sort of treat, translation, I would really welcome. Um, I think we need to be translating things into different languages. Okay, so we suggest then that Dorina Dobreva maybe contacts you via your Absolutely. Twitter link or via your uh, academic link. So thanks for Absolutely that. Absolutely delighted to point her in the right direction. Okay, um, now a question for Boo Norving from a colleague in Uppsala, uh, Eric Lundström. Are there any state-of-the-art update on stroke and COVID-19 from, uh, uh, from Eric? Over to you, Boo. Oh, state-of-the-art. Well, I, I think uh, the documents that I um, indicated that are available are extremely useful, and I think this really should be read by everyone. Uh, First out, I think, was uh, the USA, the American Heart, followed by the UK guidelines. A more policy document from Australia, Australia Asia region, and then the extremely useful document with a lot of practical advice from the Canadian um, consortium. Uh, I read the last one uh, just last night with very much interest. I thought it was very, very good, a very important point here, really, that. Uh, should be spread very much of this apply to uh, any other country really so uh, take a look at the website thank you boo okay um now back to marion a question from Yu yun jin kim i think from malaysia how can we help mental health for caregivers so i'm pleased that people are picking up that this is an, an absolute need 
And, and there are various, um, there are various uh, apps that we've been using. We've been trialing uh, some biopsychosocial interventions with carers to good effect. I mean, there isn't any concrete evidence for this at the moment, but I would suggest that carers really need to tap into their stroke support networks, to the stroke organisations who can provide that support. But there are some general well-being apps that, again, we can, we can pull together that are used for not just staff, but could be used for carers as well. OK, and on that point of connecting with um, care organisations, we're going to advertise at the end of this webinar, next week's webinar, which is the Stroke Connections web webinar led by uh, Sarah Belson, who is the uh, Stroke Support Organisation's liaison officer uh, within the World Stroke Organisation. So anybody who's interested in support for carers, um, and working with stroke support organisations, I'd strongly encourage you to register for that webinar, which will be next week on Thursday morning UK time. More details on the WSO website. Okay, right, now we've got um, uh, too many questions coming in. I'm not keeping, keeping up with them. So we've dealt with mental health for caregivers. Um, any app, oh, sorry, on, well, while you're on the line, another one from India, any app or home program for stroke patients, tele-rehab from physiotherapy department. Okay, so that's, sorry, that's from the uh, physio department in Chennai. Mm -hmm. Any app so, yes. or home program for stroke patients? So yes, uh, some of the lists that we've been pulling together have indeed those types of apps. And as I said, we're trying to amalgamate them so that so that services can navigate them much more quickly. Um, so we'll be putting that together and, and the link that I'll provide will signpost people to that. Thank you, Marion. Going up back to Boo Norbing, a question from Wayne Sunman in Nottingham. If this is a patient choice issue, um, this might affect the severity of patients coming to hospital. Do you have any evidence on whether the strokes coming to hospital are milder or more severe than usual, or is that something that we won't know for a little while yet? Uh, we took a first glimpse of that, and we had the NIA stroke score on about 60% of our patients. And uh, what I saw was that was a slightly higher proportion of patients with, with um, more severe strokes, really. So I think that those who are really apparent need to go to the hospital come to the hospital, but the difference was not so much that I really had uh, anticipated, really. And another reason, there may be very many flows here. One may be that uh, elderly people who are living in an elderly care facility are not admitted to hospital if they have a stroke, but stay. And this is one out of six, one out of seven strokes, very often more severe strokes among patients with uh, severe comorbidities, they may not come to hospital. But um, I think the, the signals that were given out early, really, that um, don't go to hospital, call first, get your advice. There is a tent outside the hospital. Don't go to the hospital directly. I think this is the most important concern that many patients with TIA and will mild stroke said, we're not going to the hospital. It's not the right time to do it. What we do not know is, did these patients instead go to primary care? Did they have a consultation there? We don't know that and we will probably never find out, but uh, we know that if you have a TIA, if you, if you have a stroke, you should go to the hospital. This is where you should be and uh, not anywhere else really. So we will be looking into these patterns and. Uh, I think there are many different uh, streams here. That okay, thank you, Boo. Uh, now we've got a question from Dalios Yatutsis asking, uh, thanking everybody for a very nice and informative and timely webinar. And it, in reply to his question, today's lecture will be online on the World Stroke Organization website. So look for World Stroke Organization. And when you arrive at the website, Dalios and anyone else who's listening, then type in the words webinar and within a day or two, you will be taken to um, a link. Um, but this is also being live streamed on um, 
uh, YouTube, so it should be available there too. Okay, so that's dealt with that one. Now a question for rehab. Um, a very important question from Christina Tangwa for Marion. With regards to rehabilitation, do you feel once it's over, A, there will be an influx of patients requiring to be seen in the community, and two, if intensity and quality of therapy will be impacted on? So do we expect a big backlog of patients in the community, Marion? I, I think that's a very perceptive question. Yes, I do think there will be a backlog. I think that's why it's important for us to get the message out and identify people sooner rather than, than later. Um, uh, I, 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 what was the second part of the question? Well, it was just how, do, how are we going to plan ahead for dealing with that black backlog? Um, I, think, I think we just need to make sure that we have uh, put people in place in order to deal with it. Um, that staff are ready. I mean, I, I, I think life will change beyond COVID. I think we do have to be aware that face-to-face -face rehabilitation is still the gold standard. So though we may be seeing uh, remote rehab being used as an adjunct to therapy, I don't think we should ever lose the fact that the face-to-face -face is what we've got the strong evidence for. But I do think there will be a backlog, yes. Marion. Okay, so we've got another um, question from Esther Tuin on swallowing assessment. Um, Marion, swallowing assessment, instrumental or non-instrumental, is considered an aerosol generating procedures. How do you cope with this in your facility, especially stroke patients with COVID-19? I, I don't have the, the, the skills to answer that. I, I, I don't know how we are dealing with that specific problem. I do know that swallowing is one of the key issues on admission to stroke unit. So I'm afraid I can't answer that today. Okay, now coming back to Boo Norving, a uh, medical question, again on the thrombosis and bleeding risk. Do people who've previously had a hemorrhagic stroke more likely to have another stroke if they contract COVID-19? Should blood thinning medication be adjusted on the onset of COVID-19? So it's what to do about antithrombotic treatment in patients presenting with COVID-19? I think at this stage where we have only anecdotal data, we have no real hard evidence that we should continue with the best evidence that we have because I think we can say that the majority of stroke during COVID pandemic will be the ordinary stroke that continue to occur and should be treated in the same way. And I don't think that we, without any good evidence, should deviate from this practice. So it's a lot of speculations here in different regions, uh, directions, but um, stay to evidence-based care as we practice it today would be my advice. Okay, so another question uh, from Cecilia Santiago. Do we have any data on newly diagnosed stroke survivors and COVID-19? I guess, and that's going to be something that will emerge from registries like um, Rick Stroke, but at the moment we don't have a lot of data on that. Is that fair? That's, that's fair and that's correct. That um, This is, of course, very important and it's very, very complex also because... Um, you need to take into account time delays, if the patient received therapies or not, or so. So there are many variables that are difficult to adjust for to see if the prognosis was uh, uh, influenced or not. And also we have this selection of cases that came to the hospital and to the knowledge uh, at the hospital. We have a selection bias here. So this will be very, very complex, I think, to um, analyze. Okay, and we have a, a sort of related question from Lorraine Signorini, which is about giving drugs after stroke uh, or TIA. You know, should we be worrying, should we be thinking about blood thinner statins and like, especially Ramipril, ACE inhibitors having a bad effect? Um, or do you think, as you just said, we should just continue offering uh, evidence on the best available evidence in patients without COVID? Yeah, this is exactly my view that uh, without any good data, I think we should not deviate from that. And it's been speculations. Some of them have been taken away 
very early about the potential risk of, of paracetamol on NSAID drugs uh, found later not to be of any substance. So keep to okay. the basic sense. Thank you, Boo. Okay, so um, on the, uh, we, we now got a question from India, Bijal Mehta, asking, are there reports of a decline in individuals with acute stroke arriving at the hospital in underdeveloped countries due to the COVID-19 crisis? Um, so I, all I will say to that, Bijal, is that we'll be discussing this at a forthcoming webinar, not next week, but the week after or soon, um, which will involve clinicians in India, Singapore and parts of Asia. So we're going to have a, a webinar focused on low, uh, the, the Asian region. Uh, and so we hope to try and tackle that question when, 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 we, you know, when we can organize that. But uh, keep a lookout on the WSO website for forthcoming webinars uh, and we'll have a go at that question. And we'll also take, we'll also organize a tweet chat on exactly that topic as well. So if you're on Twitter, keep an eye out for that too. Okay, back to Marion now, somebody anonymous one. Are any tips on delivering uh, allied health professional assessment and therapy in acute stroke and um, rehab inpatient settings? Um, so AHP assessment remotely. So there, there are, there is a, an app, I think it was on the list in one of my slides, really uh, showing that there are, uh, there are apps that you can use for assessment and how to do that online. So I've had ex heard of examples of people doing sensory assessments using, fa using FaceTime or using iP iPads and Zoom. So there's, there's ways of doing it and there is some guidance out there to, to uh, help, 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 help uh, guide people to do it. Okay, and a, a follow-up question on telehealth in the context of rehabilitation from Michael Garrow, who's listening, uh, live streaming on YouTube. So his question was about, you know, using telehealth, but his real question, or his follow-up question was, what about the use of sensors as a, as a means? So, I mean, I guess that could be things like um, Fitbits or other things, other, any thoughts on using Fitbits to make um, assess, rehab assessments in the community remotely in, in the context of COVID-19? I think what we're looking at now is great innovation and, and teams on the ground are doing some incredible things. So I would say, go forth and try it. And if it works, please share it. I haven't heard of anybody using that technology, but I do think this is a time where we need to be sharing this new knowledge. So I would say, please let us know if it's helpful. Okay, that's great. And I think that's, that's another message. You know, if you're, if you're doing something interesting, share, you know, share it on, on the WSO website, share it by Twitter, and we'll try and encapsulate all of this cumulative experience. Uh, we got a question from Jessica O'Hara. Will there be any forthcoming webinar touching on stroke in sub-Saharan Africa? Again, we'll have a go at that. Um, we obviously timed this one so that folks from sub-Saharan Africa could participate and maybe join in the, um, the webinar next week in Stroke Connections, because again, there, will be, there is participation from Nigeria and other countries where that theme will be discussed. So uh, follow, the, follow the, uh, the links on the WSO website, Jessica, and we will try and um, support your needs as best we can from the WSO. Ah, Bijal Mehta, sorry, I misplaced you. You're not in India, but you're in the UK. So apologies for misplacing you, um, but yes, we're gonna deal with low and middle income countries in Asia next week. And as I said, we're interested in supporting uh, cl stroke clinicians in sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, um, now uh, we've dealt with that one. So we're coming to the e end of our time and I would just uh, like to reflect on the value of social media in sharing um, information and sharing tips of, of new techniques. And what, what I hope that will do is create a list of research questions. And Marion, would you perhaps just like to talk a little bit about how the, 
the um, patient, the, the, the stroke association survey trying to, the patient partnership trying to identify research questions for the future, because I think this is a really, really important area. There's limited resources for doing new research and everybody's very busy. So we really need to prioritize the research questions for the future. And because the world is gonna be very different post COVID, we really need to make sure that we only address the most important questions. So do you want to just talk a bit about what the Stroke Association is doing and how people can uh, contribute to that effort? So, so thank you for raising that a really important area, as you say, limited resources. Uh, the Stroke Association in the UK has been working with the James Lind Alliance to, pri to set prioritise research questions in this area. They have done a previous uh, prioritisation for rehab in Scotland, but this is a much wider uh, survey that they're, in, and they're engaging with the public, clinicians, anybody with an interest in stroke and what they think are the important areas. And of course, we have to look to the knowledge that we have within the Cochrane Stroke Library too. So there are, um, it will be on uh, links on the Stroke Association website. I'm not entirely clear whether this, whether the consultation has closed, but if it hasn't, please contribute to it because it's important that we target our, our public money very, very carefully. And COVID, I think, raises some excellent uh, questions that we need to address. Okay, um, so we got some more questions coming in. Um, again, on the technicalities of um, swallowing assessment and um, video fluoroscopy or functional assessment of swallowing um, using other techniques cannot be done in stroke patients who have swallowing issues. How do we go about rehabilitating? Um, Marion, do you have any thoughts on that before we maybe give that one to uh, Boo? I think it's more, I think Bo might be able to answer it better to me, but I would say people with swallowing difficulties need to be in hospital and they need to have specialist swallowing guidance from speech and language therapists whose expertise is in this area. And I'm sorry, it's not my field. Okay, um, my, my guidance on that question to wh whoever has asked it is that actually, although those more advanced forms of um, assessment of swallowing mechanisms is helpful in, in really difficult cases, for the vast majority of cases, an experienced speech and language therapist working at the patient's bedside can do 90% of what can be achieved with those more advanced techniques. So I think for now, where those uh, video fluoroscopy is not feasible, that um, bedside assessment is a very powerful tool, provided the person doing it is experienced and knowledgeable. So I would put, my, my answer is trust the professionals who really know about swallowing assessment at the bedside. Can I just take, hand that over to Boo? What's your thoughts on that question, Boo? Uh, what I what came to my mind was um, so many of the details that were in the Canadian uh, recommendations on the, a lot of different uh, ways to protect uh, the staff from potentially dangerous uh, uh, procedures in the stroke care. And uh, I thought that was very, very good advice that you could read there about so many innovative, very good comments that uh, you can do it this way to protect, you can do it this way to limit the risk, and you can think this way to uh, make the exposure to the staff as small as possible. And I think okay. this is, overall is a very important principle. So the answer to that important question then, with, with concerns about any um, uh, spray generating procedures, I can't remember what the correct term is, Please look at the WSO website for guidance relevant to different countries. In reply to my question to Marion, we've had a reply from Richard Francis from the Stroke Association saying the um, James Lind Alliance survey of important research questions in stroke is still open. So if you Google Stroke Association survey, you should get to the right website. Um, uh, so um, that would be great. So thank you very much to anybody who might contribute to that. 
um, and thank you Richard Francis for the feedback. And we come back to ACE inhibitors uh, from another anonymous attendee. Boo, I'm afraid it's another medical question. What are your thoughts on using ACE inhibitors in people with uh, SARS-CoV-19? I think the answer today is that we don't know. We don't know what the, um, we know that there is this pathophysiological link with the receptor, but how to manage um, the drugs out of that, I think we simply don't know as yet. Okay, so I actually, Boo, you've rounded off the talk very nicely. So just, I think we might close with one or two brief reflections from each of our two wonderful speakers. Thank you very much, Boo, for your wonderful talk and response to all the questions. Do you have any closing, you know, one minute thought? I've been with the World Stroke Organization since its since this formation in uh, 2006. And I think this is wonderful to have this webinar. Connecting the world today and have this discussion is developed in a way that I never could have uh, anticipated. I think it's beautiful really to have the um, World Stroke Organization as leading these type of events. Thank you, Boo. And Marion, um, any closing thoughts from you before I close the session? I guess for me is just a, a heartfelt thank you to everybody who's working really hard on providing the best care to our patients. We're in this together. We need to learn from each other. Keep sharing is what I would say. Okay. And I think sharing and collaboration and not competition, closing the borders, refusing, putting the hand up and saying no, all of these things we must avoid. I would like to thank Marion and Boo, and a particular thanks to Alina at the World Stroke Organization, World Stroke Academy, for fantastic support and uh, innovation in the way that this has been disseminated. So on that very positive note, with thanks to everybody, and thanks to everyone who's looking after patients with COVID and stroke, I'll say goodbye and we'll close the session. Thank you.